Epcot surprised us with an early release of their newest World Showcase restaurant, and we got to try it out. But is this new table service living up to those high expectations, or are we going to continue booking reservations for other Epcot restaurants instead? Find out during our full Shiki Sai Sushi Izakaya review today here on DFB Guide. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Vlog. I honestly cannot believe that this review is releasing already because we were not scheduled to write it or record it for like a couple more weeks, but here we are trying out Shiki Sai Sushi Izakaya way earlier than we originally expected, and we are excited to take you along with us to explore the revamped atmosphere and tons of new menu items right now. Yep, Disney really caught us off guard with this one. When they originally announced that the new Shiki Sai restaurant would be replacing the former Tokyo Dining inside Epcot's Japan Pavilion later on this summer, we kept our ears to the ground waiting semi-patiently for something more concrete, and eventually we learned the specifics. The new restaurant would be opening August 30th. Then Epcot threw us for a loop by opening 15 days earlier than originally projected. For now, and until August 27th, you'll only be able to experience Shiki Sai as a walk-in guest only, but you can start making reservations reservations right now for dates starting on August 28th and beyond. Now I know we haven't gotten into the actual food review part of this video yet, but I also know that lots of you are already ready to eat here, like immediately. So this is how you're gonna get a table at Shiki Sai. If you're planning on being in Epcot anytime within the next few days, you can try to get your name on the walk-up wait list just as soon as the restaurant opens, which for now the hours are listed for 12 p.m. to 9 p.m. daily. But once August 28th rolls around, you could need an advanced dining reservation ahead of your trip to guarantee a seat, cause it's gonna be a popular one, we can already tell. Advanced dining reservations can can be made 60 days before your visit, but Disney World Resort hotel guests can make reservations up to 60 days in advance, plus the length of their stay up to 10 days, which could be the difference between getting a table and not getting one, depending on when you're planning on going. The best way to book those reservations is by doing so on the Disney World website or the My Disney Experience app. Reservations go live around 6 a.m. Eastern daily, but I'd recommend getting up earlier just to check if Disney pulled something sneaky again by dropping those reservations early, like around 5.30 or 5.45 a.m. Eastern, which they've been known to do. Now remember, in order to actually make these advanced dining reservations, you gotta already have a valid theme park ticket and park pass reservation for Epcot all sorted out. But note that park pass reservations won't be necessary next year for the majority of guests starting on January 9th, but for now you gotta have them for the remainder of 2023. Now if you miss your window of opportunity for reservations and kind of double checking throughout the wait for your trip doesn't come up with anything, you could have one last chance for them on the day of your visit. Last minute reservations don't always trigger for these more popular places, but they can appear to give you one last shining beacon of hope. It's always worth checking in your My Disney Experience app under the dining tip board just in case, and this one might also have a walk-up wait list that you can join when the park opens. All right, now it's time to step inside Shiki Sai for the very first time. I have been so excited about this restaurant. I am just jazzed that we finally have kind of a Japanese pub going on in Epcot. Now, like I mentioned, Shiki Sai took over the former Tokyo dining space right above the Mitsukoshi department store in the Japan Pavilion to bring guests an all new dining experience. Depending on what time of year you visit is gonna determine what kind of decor you see around the restaurant since Shiki Sai's whole personality is based around celebrating different seasonal Japanese festivals. Festivals. So when we stepped inside for the first time, we were greeted by hanging tanzaku, which are these thin strips of colored paper streamers hanging from a bamboo tree that you can write wishes on. More often than not, you'll see these kind of trees featured during the Japanese Tanabata or Star Festival. And that takes place on the seventh day of the seventh month of the year. Just a little background for you. But don't just ask me about these festivals. Ask the cultural representatives inside the restaurant who are way more knowledgeable about this stuff. A cultural representative from Japan will help guide you through each celebration. So be be sure to ask any and all questions you might have about the decor and all of the other items you see around you. Aside from the decor that adapts to the season, the more permanent installations like the hand-painted artwork and lanterns is really stunning and continue to really highlight some of Japan's natural wonders, as well as cute little woodland creatures that are just living it up and making me wish I also could be a cute woodland creature chilling underneath fireworks and cherry blossom trees, but alas. Now several of the tables inside the dining room are located right next to those expansive windows that look out across the world 
World Showcase Lagoon, which, if you time your visit correctly, these could definitely give you a great view of the Epcot fireworks from way up there. Note though that sometimes people do line the railing outside, so you may not have as good a view, it just all depends on what happens. But even if you don't get a seat by the real windows, you could get a booth next to the fake windows, which simulate fireworks and fake breezes that'll blow around the foliage during your meal. It's very cool. So one of the most eye-catching spots inside the restaurant though is the sushi bar, where you can watch the sushi chefs hard at work making your sushi fresh on site. Okay, the moment has arrived. Let's check out how this new food actually tastes and if it lives up to our highest expectations or not. While sushi is a big part of this restaurant, like a huge part, like ginormous even, you'll see what I mean by that in just a second, it's not the only food type you're gonna see on the menu because along with the sushi, you're also gonna find that Japanese izakaya, which is kind of like a pub and they kind of have tapas. They, it, everything comes in smaller portions and is meant to be shared among friends and family. So it's kind of a Japanese tapas concept. There are also a variety of items from the grill that you can pick from as well and specialty drinks too. Now, while several options on the menu are situated there all year long, Shikisai has noted that much like their dining room atmosphere, lots of their food options will rotate out each month to reflect those Japanese festivals. So fair warning, if we review something today, you don't see it on the menu when you're there, that might be why. Okay, I'm teasing you too much. Let's dive on into the actual food reviews now. We started our meal off with some of those specialty drinks on the menu. The Violet Yuzu Lemonade was made with yuzu juice, lemonade, and blue butterfly pea powder, of course, that's something that Disney tends to use a lot to kind of make a color changing drink. So when you mix it all together, you get this really pretty purple concoction. Now this was a drink that we wish was available to grab at one of the quick service locations instead, because it'd be nice to sip on while you're walking around World Showcase. The combo tastes like a cross between tangerine and lemon, but it was more refreshing and less overwhelmingly sweet. The second drink we tried was the Gari Gari Sour Ramune. This was one of the most interesting since it was soda that had a whole popsicle stuck down inside it. The popsicle was a flavor combo of of shochu and ramune, aka traditional Japanese hard liqueur and a traditional Japanese carbonated soft drink. Ramune comes in a lot of different flavors. This was blueberry. It was like a less sweet version of Sprite. So simple, slightly medicinal, but the taste of alcohol isn't overpowering or anything. And then before our food arrived, we tried one more drink, the summer's end, fitting for the season, which is made with strawberry sake, apple juice, and a splash of citrus. This was a sweeter drink, but not sweet in the way you'd expect those tropical tiki drinks to be. Instead, it was refreshing type of sweetness thanks to those strawberries, like a fresh sweetness. And even though you can still taste the sake in here, it doesn't overpower the other fruity flavors. Very light drink. Now guess what time it is? It is appetizer time! So for our apps, we ordered the agadashi tofu, the grilled wagyu gyoza, and the karage chicken. The agadashi tofu was fried tofu that the team was rather impressed with. The broth that the tofu was sitting in is dashi, which is like a miso soup, but it's more subtle and works as an accent to the app to bring out the slightly sweet flavors of the tofu. You add the mushrooms on top of that for another much appreciated layer of savory flavors and you got yourself a real nice plant-based starter right there. The grilled Wagyu gyoza was probably our favorite of the apps because it's real hard not to fall in love with all things Wagyu. Now these dumplings were soft and juicy and the meat had a nice buttery flavor to it. However, if you've never tried pure Wagyu beef before, this isn't the best representation of it. The dumpling is delicious and this definitely is a more affordable way to experience that Japanese Wagyu beef, but it's not going to be like mind-blowing, like bringing a tear to your eye kind of steak experience like I've had over at Morimoto Asia. So just a heads up on that. And finally, the karage chicken might not be what you're expecting to order at a sushi heavy restaurant, but it is great. The fried skin of the chicken is incredibly crisp and the chicken itself was juicy and buttery in a melt in your mouth kind of way. Now, if you're expecting a traditional fried chicken or tender breading, something like that, like you'll find at many of Disney World's quick service locations, you might be thrown off by the texture here because it's definitely not the same. This is more like a breading you'd find on chicken thighs, so lighter with a slight garlic and ginger flavoring. Now, that's a lot of food right there, even before we get to the entrees, but luckily we had backup to help us out, thanks to our good friends at All Ears who tackled these big portions with us. So make sure to check out their full tasting review too when you get a chance, but we're gonna cover all the food for you here as well. All right, now back to your regularly scheduled entree tastings. There are three entrees I wanna highlight now, but a fourth that I'm gonna talk about in its own point because it's just massive. The first entree we tried was the, okay, 
okonomiyaki, which is your standard scallion pancake from the grill menu. This is a good choice for those who were forced to come to a sushi-heavy restaurant, despite not being huge sushi fans, since the main flavor profile here is bacon and sweet soy sauce. Not a raw fish in sight. Then we tried the vegetable nabayaki udon, which now kudos to Disney on this one because we were very impressed. Not only was this dish just the right amount of salty, savory, but there were so many different types of mushrooms that helped add different textures and earthy flavors to the broth and noodles. And it is a vegan dish, so both plant-based eaters and adventurous eaters alike are going to be able to enjoy this one. Moving on to the ishiyaki sukiyaki rice, we were equally impressed with this dish as we were with the udon, with both flavors and the presentation of the dish. Our server brought the bowl and dish right to our table to show us exactly how the rice and beef is cooked, which we definitely appreciated. And the beef is nice and tender, though it probably could have used a bit more seasoning. Well, the rice actually had this semi-sweet taste to it. But the best part about the ishiyaki sukiyaki rice was how all the different ingredients worked together and had a subtle crunch to them thanks to the way they were prepared in the hot dish. Now, something we were really blown away by here was actually the kids' bento box, which came stocked with salmon, chicken, California rolls, a shrimp nigiri, an egg roll, fruit, edamame, and Japanese potato salad, all for 20 bucks. That would even be an incredible grown-up meal, right? All in all, the kids' bento box is a nice balanced meal for our younger folks and an adventurous one at that. Granted, if your kid isn't really one to diverge from all things burgers and french fries like mine, then $20 might be wasted on them here. But if your kid gets excited by a variety of different flavors and options on their plate, then they may be just as impressed by this as we were. To wrap up our meal, we got the signature dessert of the restaurant, the Ichigo Parfait, which was nothing super special, but still tasty. The dessert is made with layers of strawberries, cheesecake, and vanilla ice cream, and all the ingredients were very fresh and enjoyable, but I'm not gonna go out of my way to order this one every time. If you're looking for a fairly basic sweet treat to wrap up your meal, this parfait could be the ticket, and it is very pretty. Now, you might have been seeing a rather large sushi boat floating around on the internet that's covered with so much sushi that it'd probably actually sink the boat if you attempted to float it down a real live river. This sushi boat, called the Fune for four to six chef special, is from Shikisai, and yes, we did order it to see if all that food is really worth that extremely high price point. When the boat comes out to your table, there's a little celebration that takes place with lots of cheers and bell ringing before the chef explains all the different offerings aboard the ship. Honestly, this is easily some of the best sushi you're gonna have inside the Disney bubble. The fish has this velvety, buttery, smooth taste. The variety is stunning. The presentation is fun and colorful. And some of the fish aboard this boat has actually been flown in from Japan to guarantee an authentic tasting experience for your whole table. Is this a great shareable option that we enjoyed? Yes. Do we recommend it? No. Cue the record scratch. I'm sorry, what? AJ, you just got done talking about how incredible this sushi is. How can you not recommend it? Well, as high of quality as it is, it is going to set you back $300. Now, at your local sushi restaurant back home, you might be able to order a sushi boat too, and those sushi boats ain't gonna be all that cheap either, but more than likely, they'll cost you around 55 to $120, not 300. Will all those sushi restaurants have fish imported straight from Japan? No. Will they be inside Epcot? No, none of them actually, but regardless, it's really hard to recommend paying $300 for just sushi, even if it is really good sushi, because just to put this in perspective for you, if you made reservations for Ohana over at the Disney Polynesian Village Resort for an all you care to enjoy Tarasca real style dinner, you could pay for an entire meal there for two adults and two kids for $200, and you're gonna wind up with a whole lot more options than just sushi. So more perspective, I love a good steak, I love a good aged reserve steak, and my husband and I have been known to go out and spend a lot of money on a steak dinner for a special event. So if you're like that with sushi, if you wanna try excellent sushi, imported stuff, just like an incredible option that you're not gonna find anywhere else in Disney World, dude, go for it, absolutely. The only reason we're not recommending this is for just your standard family who maybe is there and trying to decide if, if it's really worth spending that much on a big sushi boat. But if you are like sushi connoisseur and like this is, this is it, then go ahead and grab it y'all because it is really good. Okay, let's talk prices for everything else. So if the sushi boat was 300, just imagine how expensive the rest of this restaurant is. But actually, when it comes to Disney's table service prices, the cost of pretty much everything else at Shiki Sai is not terrible. Again, by Disney standards. Is it still pricey? Sure. The specialty drinks were between 12 and $16 each. The apps were about 12 to 20. The entrees were around 24 to 28. And that Ichigo parfait we had was $18. So you can rack up a bill here pretty quickly, regardless of whether you order the sushi boat 
boat or not. However, the nice thing about Shiki Sai pricing is that it's a la carte. Several Disney World restaurants lately, like Roundup Rodeo Barbecue, Space 220, Be Our Guest, California Grill, they've got prefix menu prices, meaning you're forced to pay for multiple courses, typically an appetizer, entree, and dessert, whether you want those courses or not. But in the case of Shiki Sai, you can pretty much pick what you want to pay for. Just want a sushi roll and a water? Cool. Want to try multiple appetizers instead of a full entree? Go for it. Want to go all out and try a multi-course meal along with a few specialty cocktails? That choice is yours. That being said, this table service still isn't cheap by any means and may be really overpriced for parents whose kids aren't all about that $20 bento box variety. If you're looking for a cheaper place to pick up sushi and teriyaki items inside Epcot, Katsura Grill is a counter service location that's only steps away from Shiki Sai and has standard sushi rolls like a California roll and spicy tuna and salmon roll and vegetable roll for about $9 to $10 each. Along with the sushi, Katsura also has noodle bowls like ramen and udon for about $12 to $13. And while you might not get as high of quality Japanese inspired eats at Katsura as you will at Shiki Sai, nor will you get the fun seasonal decor and menu options, there's a nice outdoor seating area right outside Katsura that looks out across a beautiful and very peaceful Japanese stroll garden. It's also worth looking into what food booths might be out and about around the Japan Pavilion during the Epcot festivals. Throughout the year, Epcot hosts four different festivals, and with each fest, the Japan Pavilion provides their own food booth with different Japanese cuisine and drinks to try, including unique ramens, bao buns, maybe even a fruit sushi. Foods at the different booths usually cost around five to 10 bucks, depending on which order, and come in a sample size, so you can try multiple items if you so desire, without filling up on just one. We've actually got a free guide that'll walk you through how to conquer the Epcot festivals, no matter which festival you choose to go to, that you can find over at disneyfoodblog.com festivals right now. Or if you'd rather skip typing all that in, you can scan the QR code you see on the screen now to be directed right to our festival digital download immediately. By the way, the Japan booth at the Food and Wine Festival right now is excellent, so definitely something to try out if you do happen to eat around the festival. So is it worth it? Well, it all boils down to this. Are you better off eating someplace else? Okay, so celebrate the Japanese festivals at Shikisai if you're looking for a high quality dining experience inside World Showcase. Simply put, the food at Shikisai did not disappoint. From the udon to the sushi to the savory apps to even the overall atmosphere of the dining room, we thoroughly enjoyed our time here. We definitely rank this restaurant up there with other enjoyable table service experiences inside World Showcase like Spice Road Table in Morocco, Rose and Crown in UK, and Hacienda de San Angel in Mexico. Also, you wanna try this out if you wanna be a little adventurous. Shikisai is definitely going to give you some unique options to try, but nothing so adventurous that you're going to feel like you're jumping into unknown food territory. This is a good place to try a few new items that still have familiar flavor profiles. And maybe this is the place for you if you have a passion for learning about different cultures. One of the biggest selling points of this restaurant is the overall seasonal festival theming. Even if you've been here once, your experience the next time you visit might be completely different depending on what month or season you're making a reservation for. The cultural reps do a great job with explaining the Japanese significance of the rotational menu and dining room decor, so you're not only getting an exceptional meal, but you're also learning a thing or two in the process, which is totally on par with Epcot's overall edutainment factor that the park's so well known for and why we love it so much. Okay, now you might not want to try Shikisai if you've got mostly picky eaters in your party. Despite the familiar flavors that the menu holds, and despite there being more options here than just sushi alone, this is still a sushi Japanese style restaurant, so you're not going to find your typical pizza, burgers, chicken nuggets, or other safe food on the menu. This can make dining here difficult if you've got several non-sushi fans in your group or if your kid would rather not have a bento box full of options that deviate from a Happy Meal. And maybe you'd rather not stress over the advanced dining reservations. While walk-up availability is the name of the game right now, advanced dining reservations are probably going to be difficult to snag for this restaurant at least for a little while since it's brand new. If you'd rather eat at a table service in Epcot where the ADRs might be easier to obtain, you can always look toward options like La Creperie de Paris in the France Pavilion, Nine Dragons in China, or maybe even Teppanetto, which is a hibachi-style dining experience right next to Shikisai. Or maybe you want sushi, but you're on a tight schedule and budget. Sometimes you don't need a fancy sushi fix, you just need a sushi fix, and if you don't want to take a whole lot of time out of your park day to sit and eat super high-quality sushi, there are other spots in the Japan Pavilion like Katsura Grill and the Japan Festival Booths that will be able to hook you up with the goods at a much quicker and more affordable price point. Also, something to note is that all of the Japanese restaurants in Epcot are run by the same company 
so you're still gonna have high quality eats, just not as expensive. So now it's all up to you. Will the enticing seasonal displays and food offerings be enough to wake you up at the crack of dawn to make Shikisai dining reservations? Or are you gonna pass up this new restaurant and its $300 sushi boats? Let us know in the comments and make sure to keep checking back here for even more DFB food reviews and recommendations and restaurant news to come. Thanks for listening everyone and thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Vlog and we'll see you real soon.